Well, hello there, all you marvelous people, and welcome back to Africa. My name is Will. This is an ecologist place, the channel where we are learning more about nature by playing games. And we are back in the Voronga Savannah map here in the Hunter Call of the Wild. Now, last time we were tracking Gustav Baden and the Ghost Jackal, and we fell down that uh, bridge over there. The bridge broke, and we went wee down below, and we fell so hard. We've actually now. Um, gotten bows instead of our guns so this is going to be interesting now when editing the last episode i realized that i didn't shoot a single creature in that last episode which is interesting considering you know this is a hunting game <laughs> uh, so let's have a look here we are heading into the cave we'll see whether we get to shoot any animals today for now however we are following the a footprints here with a pure heart like yours should not fear the dead Ooh. You will be protected by your integrity, guarded by your ancestors, even as you journey into darkness. There was a ghostly figure up ahead. So, as mentioned before, this ghost jackal here may be some jackal with some kind of disease like mange, which is an infestation of mites on the skin that result in the skin falling out and all kinds of uh, bad symptoms happening and it is highly suspected that records of chupacabra a mythical creature that thing is most likely dogs which have got mange and it they don't look like dogs and as a result they've been classified as a mythical creature the chupacabra which means goat sucker if i'm not mistaken uh, because it's believed that the chupacabra will drink the blood of livestock basically drink all the blood of goats in particular Yeah, one can't really try to talk over a radio. There they are. You can't really talk about talk over a radio if you are in a cave. And now they are gone. Okay. Of course the you know, especially if you are underground like this, there's no way you can talk over a radio. Down here, if you are completely underground, now there is at least an opening over there. Um, it seems to be, sure, it's a long drop down there. I'm not going to walk along there anyway. Uh, but if you are completely underground, the sense of sensory deprivation, uh, basically it's, it's profound, if I, can put, if, you, if I can use that word. My uh, father, many years ago, he had the opportunity to go into the Kango Caves. Now, in South Africa, we've got the Kango Caves in the, near the hometown where I grew up, and tourists can go into the first part of the Kango Caves. However, there is a second and a third and who knows how many parts after that that visitors cannot go into. And in there, there are amazing uh, geological formations, amazing stalactites and stalactites and all kinds of little things. But when you go down there, you are really far underground. My dad had the opportunity to go with a, a surveying, a geological survey team. And they had to go and map out certain sections and, you know, take the distances of certain things, all those types. Grandpa, I'm not answering, so don't talk to me. Anyway, when my dad was with this geological survey team uh, and went down to the into the Kango 2, and I think I only went into 2, um, then at one point they went to go look at a bat that was on a ledge higher or further into the cave. And he took the opportunity to just stay behind a bit and he sat there in total darkness. And this was quite a few hundred meters underground. He just sat there and he said after a while, the only sound you could ever hear was like the blood pumping through your ears. And after a while, you don't even know which way is up, which way is down. You completely, due to sensory deprivation, you completely uh, discombobulated. You know, don't know what the hell's going on. And yeah, I would suspect if I were to sit down here, it wouldn't be this light. Nowhere near this light, especially not considering that it's just one little hole that has light shining into the cave here, it would be very, very dark in here. 
And if you sat down here for a while, you would completely lose track of the world around you. Yeah, however, we do have an exit, so Grandfather would be able to talk to us again in a moment. He probably is going to start dabbling on a bit. Was that? Is that your sibling signal? Grandchild, is that you? Yes, Grandfather, it is us again. And we picked up the Jackal Skull there. Jackal Skull's quite elongated, with some nice typical dog uh, features. Ancestors. I was right. You really are a hunter with noy blood. Now you believe me. You know the ghost jackal is real because you've seen it. And you have an opportunity to help me make things right. There is a tree that only appears in the moonlight. Find it. That's where you must bury the jackal's skull. And offer praise and respect to the dead on behalf of your grandfather. Hello, little ones. Hello, ghost jackals. Ah, okay, and into the tree they apparently go. But here we go. This is a nice little deciduous tree. It's either a tree that actually has shed its leaves or it is a dead one. Not sure which one it is. It looks like some kind of marula tree based on the bark that we have here. This looks very much like a marula tree. The dead do not disappear. They live on through us. The dead are always watching us. So we always have a chance to be redeemed in their eyes. Thank you, grandchild. It's a new day, grandchild, for both of us. While your brother thinks a medic should check you for signs of mushroom, <laughs> I think you have finally lifted the curse on the hunger. I carried this with like a boulder on my heart for decades. Now, it's gone. I feel five years younger. No, ten years. But I called you here so I could retire, and there's no taking that back. Obviously, the job is yours. So, congratulations, Yay. Senior Warden. Now you get to deal with your brother and his hoo tubers and his spiritual <laughs> skepticism. <laughs> congratulations. Thank you, Grandfather. And do you know what else you get as Senior Warden? Can you guess? It's more work! Hey, hey. You can't do it alone. That's why I've called in a specialist and a team to handle that task. Veteran Wilderness Guide, Dr. Dana Maritz. Dr. Dana is an acquietist. Mm -hmm. To her, there's a wrong way, and then there's her way. Now that you are senior warden, I guarantee she's going to test you to find out which way you do things. She can be overly authoritative, but if you pay attention, Dr. Dana will teach you some things. She's not always right, but she's the real deal when it comes to hunting and skill shooting. That's why weapons manufacturers put her on the payroll to sell their products. Now, don't let Dr. Dana occupy all of your time. You have official warden's work to do there in Vopaladi Amber. The Mfundla, the scrub hair population, is out of control, and it's starting to affect the living jackals that call this plateau home. Your work in this region will focus on restoring balance by applying different pressures to the animals. In addition, you still have exploring to do in Walunga, the northern reserve. Plenty of work to do up there. The river up in Walunga is predator-free, making it a safe haven for keeper buffalo. 
A dangerously large herd has congregated there. You need to disperse it, and that will be tricky. Take the time to prepare before you tackle that one. Now, even though I am officially retiring, and you are officially the senior warden who runs Varonga Savannah, I'm not going to leave my radio post. For as long as you'll have me, it will be my pleasure to continue to offer you guidance whenever I can. That's the least I can do for you after what you have done for me. Now, when I die, the ancestors will receive me with pride, despite the mistakes I've made, all because my grandchildren have made our family so proud. Yes, even your brother. He knows I'm proud of him, too. Next week, I will take both of you to the cemetery. We'll bring my home brew. We'll sing songs and share memories with our ancestors. We'll celebrate the new senior warden, because the dead are always watching us in our sorrows, and today in our joys. Howe! 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 Away. Okay, grandchild. Yes, I know I should address you as the senior warden, but you'll always be grandchild to me, okay? Now, enough babbling from old Njabolo. You're in charge. What you do next is up to you. Yo, oh my goodness. Grandfather just didn't want to stop talking. I could talk for like 10 minutes there. Okay, anyway. What we are going to be doing is whatever we want. What? He's back! Scrub hairs and side strap jackals in Vipula de Amber are concerning. The plateau is inaccessible to larger animals, so smaller species like hare and jackal have always flourished there. But both populations are outgrowing the balance of the environment. The hares reproduce so quickly they've, uh, what's the word, saturated the jackals, who can't eat them quickly enough. Without more aggressive predators to cull them, soon those hares will overpopulate the region. For their part, the lucky jackals are glutting themselves on easily accessible hare meat. That makes them slow, lazy, and more prone to threats from other predators who might enter the territory. Not to mention they could die out if the land can't sustain the hares. So between motivating lazy jackals and pressuring happy scrub hares, you've got work to do. Okay, please tell my grandfather has now finally stopped talking, that we can do things. <laughs> He just really loves the sound of his own voice. Now, there are some scrub hairs over here. Now, Grandfather was talking a lot here about the high density of scrub hairs, which is similar to in Sim Safari. There was that one episode, and I'll link it up at the top there, where we had to control the scrub hair population. And that's because in Sim Safari, and here as well, there aren't predators to keep the, uh, the hairs populations under control where in uh, some safari the predators had been taken out of the reserve and you had to bring them back into the reserve and in this game here it's because apparently the lions can't get up here to the plateau to eat them which is not the case lions would be able to get up here very very easily so that's a little bit of nonsense but anyway grandfather is very set in his way he loves to joke that maritz uh, the one researcher lady she is very set in her way but yeah after the, these missions, it's come, I've come to realize that Grandfather is yeah, also very much set in his ways. Okay, now we are in this lower section of the reserve. We can do quite a few things around here. We are going to be spotting hopefully some um, springbuck poop as well. We're just making our way to the outpost, which is right over there as well. Now, Grandfather wants us to take the role of predators. Uh, he wants us to... He says, motivate the jackals and also keep the hare population under control. Now, nature will tend to find balance. Now, balance is a relative. We as humans see balance as the, it remains constant, where the savannah won't change the way, in the way it looks, in the animals that are there, the abundance of the animals of the different groups that are there. 
But nature doesn't work like that. Nature, when it's, when we say nature finds a balance, it's more a case of nature abhors a vacuum. If there are lots of plants, the herbivore, herbivore population will increase. If there are lots of herbivores, the carnivore populations will increase. And grandfather says that he's worried that because there are so many hares, the jackals will increase in numbers. And then as a result, when there are no more hares, the jackals will die uh, in great numbers. And yes, that will happen. But that will be natural. And considering that these are side-striped jackals, it's again... Is it really going to be that big a deal if the hares do drop in abundance? Because the side-striped jackals are a little bit more omnivorous. They will switch over to fruit if they run out of meat to, to eat. But yes, there will probably a few, be a few individuals that will die. But they won't increase in such high, to such incredibly high numbers in any case. I don't know. I think Grandfather is worried about nothing. But in any case, we are going to have, an, have a look and see what he exactly he wants us to do. But first, we are going to go get this outpost over here. Now, now that we are hunting with bows, it's going to be very interesting to encounter buffalo. Uh, to some extent, I'm hoping we can do that one today. But to some extent, I'm also not necessarily particularly keen on encountering a buffalo and then hunting it with a bow. I think let's make that... Our objective now is try to take down a Cape Buffalo with a bow. Interesting, it's a little landmark on the way up to the post there. Uh, so we're hunting, we're going to be hunting Buffalo with a bow, of course. Uh, but over here, the landmark here, they talk about Diamphidia, which is a type of beetle. Now, Diamphidia then, I believe that is the one, yes, it mentioned it there. Uh, that the Bushmen, the sand people of Botswana, South Africa and Namibia used in the, and Zimbabwe as well, used in their arrows. So when the Bushmen or the sand used poison in their poison arrows or for their poison arrows, they didn't just use a single toxin. They used a variety of poisons. They made a whole cocktail, uh, some plants, some animals, some all kinds of things mixed together to make a very, very potent toxin. And Diamphidia was one of those components. So it's the beta larvae, they would dig it up, and the pupa as well, and then they would actually grind that up and mix that. As far as I recall, they would boil a whole bunch of different uh, poisonous compounds together, and that would then re you know, be used to make the, the toxin. And there was also a plant which would be growing in the areas, in any of the areas where they were, known as Bushman Poison Bush which is highly, highly toxic. And that plant also was thrown into the mixture. The roots and the stems and the leaves and all those things were thrown into the mixture when making the poison for the poison arrows. And I honestly don't know how well it's going to go to go after the Widowmaker with this, with a bow. Actually, this is the wrong one. That one has the arrows knocked for smaller game. So let's go for the large, proper broad head here. Anyway, let's make our way through the fever trees again, over to the lookout point up ahead. So do remember, as we're making our way to the lookout tower there, that on the, in the community tab on the channel, there is, of course, the votes that you can put in for which map I should play after uh, the Vuronga Savannah map. So I've got the five newest maps posted there, and you can select which one of those ones you would like most like to see me do. After that map then, of course, the five oldest maps will be voted on, and then again the five newest, and so on and so on, until we eventually run out of maps, so we can play this game for a, a, for quite a long time. <laughs> now, I will soon be up, out with students on different excursions, which will last quite a bit, and so there may be times when I do not have any videos being uploaded, so do just be patient. I'm will I'm not I will be back. I'm not completely gone, hopefully. The reserve Nualanga is bounded by a river that offers a source of hydration and protection to many of our animal friends. The river boundary even keeps poachers out since it prevents them quickly entering and exiting their reserve. But now that the land is devoid of large predators, this safe haven has grown too safe, mm -hmm. to the point where it is being dominated by the Cape Buffalo Head congregating across Nualanga. These Cape Buffalo are far larger and deadlier than any of the wildebeest herds crowding the Zonga. When dealing with them, 
if you're shooting within the lethal range, a split second can make the difference between life and death. So mm -hmm. have your wits about you. Start by investigating the region. Spot and observe a Cape Buffalo. Get a sense of their presence in the region and practice a stealth approach so you don't get stomped. I got a bad feeling about this. We're going to go down along the mountainside here and hopefully see a Cape Buffalo before it spots us. Now there is a watering hole right up ahead. There's a good chance that we're going to find some buffalo around there if it's realistic at all. Oh, there's one down below as well. So there's a good chance that there's going to be some buffalo down here as well. Buffalo really love wallowing in the mud. Like you can see all around the edge of the little pool over there. Lots of buffalo would be congregating around there. And they, of course, roll in the mud uh, to remove parasites, especially ticks, old skin cells, all those types of things also. But especially trying to remove ticks and prevent ticks from actually biting onto them. So it's a little bit of a parasite control. Uh, and you would very often find, especially big old bulls, the Daga boys, which means mud men. Uh, they would be hanging around the muddy areas of watering holes as well. So we should uh, exercise caution as we are making our way down here. There's AK Buffalo. Look at that grumpy buffalo fish. Yeah, he is, he is a very, very grumpy buffalo one. Buffalo stares at you like you owe it money. Yeah. When they charge, it's easy to think the matter is personal. Yeah, that one was aggressive, so... Only the lions were ever born enough to take on the buffalo. I've seen them try. But the difference between the buffalo and many other prey is when one buffalo is attacked, its herd will come to defend it. So really, uh -huh. you are never in a confrontation with one buffalo. Imagine that you are confronting the entire herd. Yes, the and one here in he front comes. Of you could be the one that kills you. But if you aren't maintaining your awareness, the deadlier buffalo could be beside you or behind you. That's a shot on it. Oh, that that went kind of so better. The safest way to bring down a buffalo? Oh my word! Not from a distance, not with their thick hide. Huh? The safest way to down a buffalo is to do it quickly with a high caliber weapon. Or a bow, apparently, Granddad. You need the 470 Nitro Express to get this job done. If you don't have one on you, you can obtain one at the nearest outpost. Okay. The 470 Nitro is a big gun, but the buffalo wow. has an unconventional skull shape and very protective ribs. Make sure you know where to aim before you fire. Harvest one buffalo with your 470 <laughs> Nitro. Make sure you have a feel for your weapon before continuing. And because I am your grandfather, I am obligated to say it. Be careful. Granddad, we just took down a buffalo with a bow. I think we're all right. But we are going to be taking down a buffalo with that specific one next time. So thank you very much for joining us uh, today, everybody. Hope you enjoyed it. We didn't talk a lot. Grandfather did most of the talking. But we'll be back next time and hopefully I'll get to say a few more things than Granddad does. So until next time, everybody, stay safe. I'll see you all soon. Bye.